So, hello. How are you today? We're good. We're good. That's great. So, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name's MJ Mouton, and I am the author of Tiny Thinker Science Books for Kids. Uh, what it is is a series of science books that are written basically for a four to six year old, uh, covering the basics of, uh, of, uh, scientific theories or science concepts, but it's written as though the scientist who was on the forefront of those concepts uh, was a kid. So uh, our first book, Charlie and the Tortoise, is Charlie. It's uh, written about Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin uh, goes to the Galapagos and he discovers that uh, finches have different beaks, which in reality, uh, Charles Darwin t carried specimens back to England and an ornithologist helped him work out the fact that they were all uh, separate uh, species of finches. But, you know, it's a children's book for four to six year olds. So we kind of we kind of cut out the ornithologist part and just left it to Charlie and uh, uh, him going to the Galapagos and coming up with his theory of evolution. Uh, which there's many more books. Uh, I, I actually wrote about 60 children's books seven years ago. Oh, wow. For my kids, uh, 20 of them, my wife says, suck. Uh, so we actually have 40 that we're sitting on, and uh, all 40 will be published. So That's great. Uh, with our publisher is uh, Rare Bird Lit uh, out of Los Angeles. So I, I, I neglect to call out their name whenever I do these interviews, but they're a pretty awesome group of people because they, they, uh, they publish books outside the box. Uh, you know, LGBT books. Uh, books about the environment, uh, stuff to that nature, but they also they also publish some world class memoirs of people as well. So uh, they they had faith in in these books, and so we should see all forty uh, to a year. And the next book coming out will be uh, Rachel Carson, and it's on uh, what Rachel did for us was uh, DDT or the pesticides that were being used. Uh, to spray fields and such uh, was basically softening the eggs of a lot of uh, birds and so we saw a decline in the bird populations of like peregrine falcons and eagles almost a decimation well she wrote a book called Silent Spring eventually uh, which led to the environmental movement which led uh, to the banning of DDT uh, by simply asking the question we know how it helps us but how does it hurt and so now we're, uh, Rachel, Rachel's basically a hero. Our, so our next book's about Rachel. And after that, it's Carl Sagan, and everybody knows that guy. I don't need to elaborate on him. Right. So I have to ask, uh, why did you start writing children's books? I started writing the children's books because it was, uh, I walked out of school and not knowing... I walked out of school not knowing the basics of, uh, <laughs> hey, bye-bye. Oh, you get it. So, uh, I walked out of school not knowing the basics of, of things. So, we covered adaptations in school. They only called them adaptations. We didn't go any yeah. further than to call them, right. to call it what it was, evolution. We didn't learn about the genome. We didn't learn about DNA. We didn't learn all, all that biology was, was basic anatomy. And so uh, we were pretty much held to that when you're in chemistry in high school. And this is back when I was in high school, 20 something years ago. We were, we were, we just learned the periodic table for the most part. We, we didn't even learn about say, uh, you know, how, how things really snap together. We just learned that they did. That information might have been covered, but a lot of it's glossed over. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that teachers have only X amount of time to cover some stuff. But it seemed to me throughout school that we pretty much just skimmed over a lot of the things that I found to be more important later on in life. Uh, once I moved away from home and I went to work in the field that I did, uh, which is the environmental field, uh, I travel all over the country. What we do is we demo uh, either oil refineries or we clean up environmental messes. And then once we've done that, uh, 
we we've seen what the earth looks like underneath so you start finding uh you know in in the actual topsoils you find uh stuff that's more into anthropology you'll find some arrowheads or you'll find like even peace pipes and stuff like that i found from indians but once you get further down into the ground further north you get into the bedrock and when you get to the bedrock then you start finding fossils and uh you start finding uh things that are that are that are a lot older and so what happens is is i actually had people later on in life that i could bounce those questions off of uh this is after school so i got to learn uh you know, when we would see a different soil type, I could ask a scientist. When we'd see a different rock type, I could ask a scientist. It baffled me that I could see different strata in, in the rock, but it was all from the same era. And and so uh, having, having the ability to, to do that, and, and then I realized I, I, this is easy to learn. Why did we gloss over this in school? Why didn't we do that? So I didn't want my kids to be pigeonholed like I did. Because I never saw a science degree as a viable option being where I was from in a southern rural area. Uh, to become a scientist was way out. And it amazed me thinking back because Louisiana has such a diverse ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have estuaries and we have these swamps and we have uh, these marshlands and, and uh, all different animal types in it. I mean, I live down here and in my yard alone, this weekend, we were walking around, we were looking at all the skinks and the newts and the lizards, the anoles, uh, the, uh, you know, a fish with five or six varieties of, of uh, species of uh, fish that's in there, the uh, blue herons, the uh, cranes that are in my yard, all the different birds. So this is just in my yard, mm -hmm. and I probably have at least 20 to 25 different species that I could see from my back porch and just a few hours. Mm -hmm. So we have all this animal life, we have all this wonderful stuff, and looking around the yard, and the irises are popping up, and, and all these native plants, and we should be producing biologists like crazy mm -hmm. here because it's just surrounding. I mean, it surrounds you here. So I never even saw it going to school that it was an option for me. So I didn't want my kids to, to be that way. So I decided that I was going to teach them some basic science concepts. And at minimum, if school didn't teach them, they would walk out of school understanding the basics and, and being pretty, pretty, uh, pretty rounded in, in all of them from physics to chemistry and uh, biology and uh, even books about mathematics. Uh, even though you need math to do all those things, uh, you know, just to make some books that were fun about math. So I have a book about Fibonacci. Uh, and what Fibonacci did was, uh, uh, amongst other things, was he brought the zero to Europe. So uh, that book goes, a number for nothing, nil, not a zilch, none, a number to count when there's lesser than one. So can you imagine a time that Europe didn't have a zero yeah. to work with, you know? And uh, Fibonacci brought that from India. So, uh, just to make a fun mathematics book. But for the most part, it was to because I hope that my daughters would get that inspiration in school and they would learn about those things. But I didn't, so I was worried about it. So I wrote the books. That's great. So, you, you said, uh, did you say you wrote uh, Charlie and the Tortoise first? Charlie and the Tortoise was the first book, uh, I believe. Uh, this was seven years ago, man. I was writing books left and right. So, but uh, what, I think so. Okay, so uh, why why Darwin uh, so early on? Why Darwin so early on? Because we, uh, because evolution is probably the thing that I found the most fascinating, and it was probably the thing I think was glossed over the most and it was uh, for the most part what I could still see was getting glossed over by by people calling them just adaptations and not going any further than just adaptations to to uh, general environment you know they, they teach land farms and ecosystems and stuff like that and teach you about savannas and this and 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 those kind of things but they 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 only talk about the adaptation as to, to 
to, to match those things. They don't talk yeah. about the, the millions of years of the process. So you walk away not realizing that multi-million, uh, uh, just millions and millions and millions of years uh, of progress happen. You know, it's only taught to where a river divides two deer. One deer becomes brown, one deer becomes red. That's mm -hmm. pretty much what you're going to walk away from knowing. Yeah, and it's kind of, in my opinion, it's kind of a slippery slope to teach you know, adaptation because they they allow limited uh, like increases in genes and things like that, but then oh no we can't go any further than this archetype this arbitrary archetype that we actually haven't defined we know nothing about you know but when you read the the creationist literature they have no idea what any of the their like you know ancestral deer the, the type was or anything right. like that and even though even though you can go back in time and uh, find a one horn type deer, you know, that you could call the unicorn, which is in the in the uh, King James Version. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably a rhinoceros. <laughs> probably a rhinoceros. But, a Dicerus unicornis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there, there's a... It, I was kind of upset about that uh, later on in life because I felt I was cheated because it was easy. It's not easy to learn everything i mean you have a vast knowledge of the subject you're going to school to be a biologist but the general basics is not that hard and what i did with my daughter lila is we covered our entire dining room floor with brown paper and we started with a dot and we just drew a dot that was on a piece of paper and then i said okay this dot is an animal uh so what what kind of feature do you want your animal to have next and I think she went with eyes. She wanted it to be able to see. And uh, I was like, you know, that's a good idea because now to be able to find food. But, I mean, how's it going to move? It's just kind of a dot there, you know. And so we had this conversation as we're working through. And eventually she had something that resembled an animal. And then as as it progressed, uh, then I would throw in different, different things like, okay, you got a predator you got another animal that happened just the same way, but it's a little bit faster. So what are you going to do? And uh, so we just kept on drawing these animals. And there was probably 100 animals drawn. I mean, mm -hmm. that sounds like a lot, but it went from a dot, a dot with two little eyes or whatever. And then we got to where she had something that looked oh, like a theropod or, uh, you know, uh, got to stuff that looked like dinosaurs. And then... Uh, I threw this scenario at her, and she's she's little, and she's drawing this out. And I threw this scenario out, and I said, okay, big asteroid come, but everything's dead. And uh, we started over. I said, okay, so what survives? And, uh, you know, what survived was things that lived in cage, uh, caves and stuff like that and smaller things. That, and uh, she started working it out from there. And eventually we ended up with, with something that was semi-humanoid uh, in a sense. And this was just... This isn't me drawing. This is her drawing it. And then I was able to open up a book when we finished. And I said, you just drew what's in this book. And you didn't know, you know. And I could show her that this was this was it. And then I think right after that, I wrote the Charlie book because uh, because she got it. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that this one little exercise that we took that probably took us three or four hours playing in the in the uh, in, in the uh, dining room. And she understood yeah. that millions and millions and millions of years, the tiniest of tiny little changes eventually could make something completely different from what you started with. Right. And she was four. And yeah. she understood it. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that should be introduced in uh, early on, there, there were like three topics that should be like concept of reproduction, I mean, not all the fiddly bit details, but you know, the overarching concept of reproduction, the concept of variation within you know, offspring, and then the concept of long ages. If basically, if you can introduce those three concepts in like elementary school, and then you know, build on build on them as you go, I think that that will go a long ways towards teaching kids about evolution. And I think that you, you can and you should go that route because that's exactly the route that happened for, say, Mary Anning, who was one of the greatest uh, fossil hunters ever, a fossil dealer or whatever you want to call her. And even whenever Charles Darwin was on the Beagle, he was reading a book by Charles Lyle. And it was a book about the 
you know, the age of the earth. And so he, that's, that's the, the, he started out realizing that the earth is old. Mary Anning was, uh, one of her, her, uh, people that would buy her fossils from her was a guy named Adam Sedgwick. Adam Sedgwick was, uh, Charles Darwin's professor. So all these people had this tie in and then they, they were all in, that was just this big social circle of people who understood the concept that the earth was old mm -hmm. at that time. And those guys became the pioneers because they had that knowledge. And, and it's a lot easier to understand once you can put, you know, you can, you can talk space with somebody, but if they have no concept of cosmic distances, they still mm -hmm. think UFOs can come in a couple of years from one place to another, nor understanding that you'd have to bend space or something like that to make it happen or travel the speed of light to make it happen in six years to get from out to the door. They have no concept of the size. And once you have no concept of the length of time of things, and it's, 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 it's really hard. And, uh, I have, a, I have a house and a yard full of fossils. And the average person can walk up there and I'll say, how do you think that fossil is? And they'll go, uh, a couple thousand years, a hundred thousand years old, 200,000. They have no, they have no idea. Right. That's something that's easy to teach to a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. And if you can get that concept to a four-year-old and they already start their, their life thinking, you know, the, the earth is old. They, they can understand how this Cambrian explosion can end up to us. I don't even remember what your question was, but that's where we went. <laughs> well, it was, uh, <laughs> why Darwin first? Oh, why Darwin first? Okay, I was yeah. right on track then. There you go, yeah. So, and and that was the reason why, is, is that seemed, uh, we, we had, before I wrote the books, we did that exercise, and she understood it. And so, uh, it made that one easy. So, what, uh, why do you think it's important to teach people about concepts like evolution and, and particle physics and things like that? Inspiration. And for no other reason... My kids may grow up to do anything that has nothing to do with that. But if she doesn't know about that, that's not an option to her. And so you take, for instance, if you go into, uh, say, the inner city of Chicago and you and, and you have you're, you're in an economically depressed area of African-American kids and you say, who is Jackie Robinson? Every kid has swung a bat saying, I'm Jackie Robinson, or knows who Jackie Robinson is, because he's a hero to aspire to. Yet you ask, who is Percy Julian? And not a single person knows. And Percy Julian was possibly the greatest chemist that America ever produced. Now, he was from Birmingham, Alabama, but he did all of his work in that Chicago area, in Oak Park area. Nobody knows who he is. The greatest chemist. Any any of the medicines that come from, say, the alkaloids of plants, the, he basically pioneered the uh, the synthesis of the drugs that were in plants. So uh, he started out with progesterone and stigmasterol, and but then he's the guy who gave you cortisone. Yeah. You know, uh, so all these medicines that we take today have Percy's name on it, yet nobody knows who he is, right? Well, what if one kid is inspired by the fact that Percy Julian is the greatest chemist ever, but is never introduced to it? And so the reason why it's important is merely inspiration. You're, a kid could, say, read a book that'll be a future book by Mary Ward. Mary Ward wasn't a scientist. Mary Ward wrote a book at one time called, uh, you know, uh, the view through a microscope or the earth through a world through my, my microscope and Mary Ward was just a little kid who liked to draw grass and bugs and plants and little things mm -hmm. and then uh, an astronomer uh, a friend of her dad said hey, you should get that girl a microscope and they got her a microscope and she started drawing the smallest of details well eventually she produced a book and uh, she self-published it because she didn't think that a, a, a publishing company will publish a book from an uneducated female and then uh, that book went through eight, eight, uh, uh, eight prints uh, mm -hmm. of amazing. So you never know where inspiration is going to come from. Some other kid could read about Mary Ward, go out in the yard, decide they want to draw bugs, animals, insects, mm -hmm. 
and be inspired to be, say, the next Mary Ward or be inspired for somebody else along that line, like the guy who, uh, who, who, uh, George Cuvier, who, uh, basically, uh, reworked, a uh, uh, taxonomy of uh, animals, you know, uh, you know things die. Yes. And I so, forever. and, and he basically, I have a book on him. He basically got his start from his mother was an artist and he would go out in the yard and draw things. Uh, the animals that were around his house and stuff like that. By the time he was 17, he knew more about animals than anyone else. And he was a professor at 17 years old, you know, and then changed the world. <laughs> but he was a creationist, too. He was. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, uh, Linnaeus was also a creationist. Yeah. yeah if the, the roots but, of biology are often in. But, but, <laughs> but if they had that knowledge that we have now, that would have changed the way they looked at things oh, because, definitely. yeah, he, he would have been able, you know, he started off with just the outsides of animals and then was able to expand once he got to where he was in a college setting and he could look at the insides of animals. Imagine what would have messed his mind up if he could actually look and know that they have a, a, a code uh, yeah. of genes. So, uh, but I have a book about him too. And, uh, but that's the thing is, maybe one of these people will inspire a kid. Uh, I was easily inspired. I walked out not knowing anything. And just meeting a biologist on my job site inspired me that I said, I need to sit down with some books and learn. Uh, and so... Uh, I guess... I guess... You know the the reason why the and the books were important to me and and why why they are is just if it inspires a single kid. I mean, bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think I think that is great. I think that's really awesome. Uh, comment. I think that one of the strongest points about children's literature in general, and especially the type that you're producing and putting out there, is uh, I think of my own family. They're not particularly science literate. They don't really care. It doesn't affect their daily lives. So there's no reason for them to stress it to their children. Mm -hmm. But whenever he goes to the bookstore and they pick out books like they do every month, mm -hmm. he can pick out one of these. And that's a doorway in to him understanding the concepts, but also his parents realizing that they exist at all. You know, right. that these are things that they can invest in as well. Well, one of the things that we talked about when we were producing the books was the fact that these books are made for kids who are one to eight years old. Well, kids when they're two and three are gonna have parents reading to them. Now we put enough in the books because I have kids. I know what kids like in a children's book. They like to be able to point out stuff that's in the book. So we have lots of little Easter eggs for kids to point at in there so that smaller kids enjoy the books. But even when you're small, you're still absorbing. So they're hearing the word atoms, they're hearing the word particles, they're hearing the word small. They're getting a general idea. But the parents that have to read these books to kids are going to learn something. And uh, you'll be surprised of how many people are scientifically illiterate. And, and I wouldn't even consider myself well, extremely scientifically literate, you know, to, to, to where I would, I would be on a, you know, uh, I know how things work and I know how things happen. But I'm writing books for four to six year olds. I don't have to know the scientific name of each bug, you know. It's just a bug to me. I think Hitch is such a great staple because of that. Whenever I used to read books with my two-year-old cousin, he loves construction. But he would point out and count every single piece of equipment related to construction in a book. And Hitch is something you can so easily follow and spot in a hide-and-seek manner. You can count how many times mm -hmm. it's in the book. And it's a way to keep him engaged from page to page. And I have to give my wife credit for that because whenever uh, – you'll notice that the stories are not written with Hitch in the story. Hitch was a Hitch. Hitch came later. My wife says, "If if this is a series of books, Mario, you need to have a protagonist, something that kids can identify with, a symbol that kids can identify with all throughout the book series." So I have to give credit to my wife for the creation of Hitch, which Hitch was a uh, when we created Hitch, uh, the idea was always that it would be a beagle, but we had so we had a lot of people draw out. Uh, versions of Hitch before we came to a conclusion of what Hitch would be. Okay. Uh, well, I, I just want to say, I think it is uh, it is great that these books are out there to teach these concepts, or to get 
kids thinking about these concepts, you know, at a young age, because, as you said, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of, uh, of scientifically illiterate people, and, uh, being on the internet, uh, doesn't help a lot, which is funny, because they have all the resources they need to, at their fingertips, and they never go look at it, you know. Well, to, uh, they have the resources at their fingertips, but you also have people who are, who are in this movement of uh, anti-science that are well-funded, that are able to put their links at the top of Google searches. So, say, I ran into it with research in uh, amber, right? Okay. And I type in the word amber, I type in a question that I remember, and the first thing that came up was a uh, uh, creationist type website that showed that amber could be made in a short period of time under these things, and this was the top hit. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's looking, if somebody opens that up and looks at it as being, you know, the top hit, they, without knowing any better, because you got to understand relatively few people know who ICR is or any of those groups, you know, less than a fraction of a percent of this country. But if somebody is going to look up the word Amber and then that's the first thing they see, well, then they don't realize that it came from 45 million years ago. You know, they think it came from recent times and those guys will win if, if, they're able to put out this information and afford to keep it at the top of list. Oh yeah, I've uh, part of my channel is is spent debunking stuff like that. Like I have a video titled uh, "The Source Methods Approach." Mm -hmm. uh, in that video, one of the things I look at, I look at an article uh, very similar to that, which is about oil formation. This guy, he's a he's a geologist, uh, he's a creationist, and he says oil can form rapidly. And so he lays out this whole case and even cites technical literature for it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you actually read the technical literature that he's citing, though, which most people aren't going to do because it's, it just looks like a lot of jargon mm -hmm. to most people, right. you realize he's not actually making his case from the technical literature. He's he's mis he's using this as a, kind of a hand-waving, you know, like, to direct your attention away from the argument he's actually making, he wants it to seem like it's based in the science, because the the papers he's using he actually say the exact opposite of what he's saying that they say, uh, and so it's yeah I think that's well and and basically he has enough information out there that he, like you said nobody's going to read it but one of the things I, I was watching a video that you put out and uh, the video was was uh, about a a guy who found uh, some kind of triceratops type. Mark Armitage. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So w we're a fossil. We're a fossil hunting and a fossil finding family. We go out and we find stuff. Mm -hmm. For that guy, there's there's multiple ways that you can go out and find fossils. You can mm -hmm. just go out and willy-nilly look at the ground and eventually you'll see something. Mm -hmm. Or if you're going to look for fossils of a certain time frame, Right. Uh, you're you're going to have to go to a certain area to find a fossil of that certain time frame. Mm -hmm. Well, that guy, regardless if he wants to admit it, used real geologist information to get to the spot where he could find and identify the animal that right. he found. Yes. Everything about what the guy in that interview did uh, with finding the fossil that he had had to do with real science. Mm -hmm. What he did with that information after, he did it to draw a paycheck. And he did it to draw a paycheck from a well-funded group of people. So when you go out and you find fossils, we could be driving down the road and uh, you can open up uh, online and find the geologic, uh, the maps that's done. And, you know, scientists know because when continents come together, they, you know, how they know how they come together. They push up, they go down, they fold under. Right. All those things, they, they, they can tell you. That this area right here, there's a place we go out in, in Texas, and the, the big flat area is Permian era. Well, the next rock formation over is Cretaceous. They know that. You know what you don't find in the Permian era? Cretaceous stuff. Right. So you, you're, you're down in the Permian era, and you're finding, uh, for the most part, marine fossils that are there. But then you go into the Cretaceous area, and you're actually going to find some bones of some, some sort that are completely different. Right. Uh, so we're driving down the interstate and we realize, okay, these outcroppings of rocks, they're Devonian era. We're going to find these fossils, these fossils, these fossils, these fossils. That guy has to have that same information to go find what he's finding. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they can they can BS the rest of the world, but if you know what you're doing and you know how to go find fossils and you know what you're looking for, I know what I'm going to be finding before I ever touch the dirt or I hop in the car or put gas in the car to go there. I know what I'm going to find. He did the same thing. Yeah, that's how they. That's how uh, Tiktaalik was predicted by uh, Neil Shubin right. uh, at all back in 99, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, if... if uh, uh, Answers in Genesis, actually, they're liter- in their literature, they use, and I, I just pointed this out in a video I did, uh, I just put out uh, yesterday, I think, is they use the terms, all the geologic terms, like mm-hmm. Cretaceous, Jurassic, Devonian, etc. Mm-hmm. They use all those terms to talk about the strata, but then they turn off their brain, I guess, and then say, oh, no, we're just going to make up all this stuff about, yeah. you know, it's creationist. Blood of blood strata is what they call it. And the, the beauty about Neil Shubin is, is, you know, they knew that it was the right time where this Devonian era rock was being exposed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a prediction made that, hey, if we're going to find this animal that is between, say, uh, an amphibian and something that's walking on the earth, it's going to be in this in this area. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a, uh, you know, everything that you want to see happen in science happened right. For Neil to find what, well, I say Neil, but that group right. found Neil. Neil uh, wrote My Inner Fish and became famous, but uh, more famous for it. And I, I actually have a book about that as well, except I don't write about Neil Shubin because he's not dead. Uh, it's called... Uh, not yet. <laughs> yeah. It's actually called Tiki and Rose, and it's a story. Uh, how I wrote the children's book, it's not going to be in a Tiny Thinker series, Uh but it's another book that I wrote for my kids. And what, what Tiki and Rose is, is Tiki is Tiktaalik, right? And uh, there's a there's another fish that's right there. And uh, he he, uh, he he says, hey, I'm going to race you. Uh, we're going to race around the reef. And uh, 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 Tiki just walks right over it and wins. Uh, <laughs> Tortoise and the Hare type book. Right. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I'm taking credit for uh, saying, "Hey, that's how that's how he decided to walk on land. He was trying to win a race." I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, it's it's, I, and these, yeah, I think these these kind of books are are very necessary because it's it's not even so much that the information isn't out there. It's like, and a lot of times it's difficult to get to. It's very difficult to read a technical paper. Mm-hmm. You know, you see them. They're 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 massive, often. And, they contain a lot of jargon, mm-hmm. and so the average person is not going to look at a technical paper and go, "Oh, I know exactly what that's talking about," right? right. Yeah. Or even a kid is not going to go. If you give a kid a science book mm-hmm. that's just written as facts, say, mm-hmm. say there was a book about Charles Darwin, it just says Charles Darwin was born in England or Charles Darwin was born on this date, and then it just goes through facts about his life. Mm-hmm. Your kids will own that book. You'll read it to them. They're probably going to nod off before you ever finish. And the other thing that they're not going to do is they're not going to go grab it off the shelf and bring it back to read at nighttime. These are bedtime stories. Uh, my kids, even growing up with these stories, uh, I, I have my youngest is five. She actually goes and gets the books that I, I wrote and brings them to the bed and says, this is what we want to read tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I get that from so many kids. That's their go-to book at night. They're a bedtime story. We sneak the science in. There's still a story involved. Charlie's going on an island to look for animals, insects, and plants, and it's written in rhyme form, which is seemingly taboo amongst people who uh, review books these days. <laughs> but apparently, people who review books don't have little kids that go and pick books off the shelves every night. They just live in their their yeah. office. Yeah. yeah, my my kids go and get books, and I'll guarantee it's always the rhyming books. It's always the ones that have the most stuff to point at on the inside, and uh. Uh, I'm going to say six times out of ten, it's Dr. Seuss, yeah. which uh, Dr. Seuss is educational in itself. I mean, he did science books, too. He did books about dinosaurs, books about fossils. Uh, and I don't know if a lot of people really realize that or know that, but, I mean, there's there's some good books in there. So the books are meant for a kid to go fuck off, and they're a bedtime story. We sneak the science in is what we say, but, I mean, you can see we don't hold back on it. Uh, you've read them. Obviously, uh, the you know, uh, I don't think it's a sugar-coated version for a four-year-old. I think it's enough. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, I definitely think so. Yeah, when I was um, when I was younger, 
Uh, my mom read me a book uh, called uh, Ritia Dawn, which is about uh, this guy who's a, a phytosaur back in the Triassic. Phytosaurs, were, they were like crocodiles, but mm-hmm. instead of the nasal passage being on the end of their nose, it was like up here by their eyes. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you know, she read that book to me, and I really loved that book. And so now I know a lot more about the phylogenetics of of these guys. I know kind of the the more adult stuff about them, but I was introduced to them, uh, you know, way As a back kid? then. Yeah. And that might have been a significant part of your inspiration of why you're where you're at now. Yeah. You know, uh, on the road to being an evolutionary biologist, and you never know which point that is. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, when he was eight years old, went to the uh, planetarium and. He, you know, he grew up in New York City, so he'd never seen so many stars. And he's like, hey, what's this? All this up here. And that was an inspirational moment. Now he runs a Hayden Planetarium. Yeah. Uh, so many of these books that I wrote, the kids were inspired when they were, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old. Uh, Carl Sagan wanting to know what, what, what a star was. And then uh, what happened there is his mom gives him a library card. And he goes to the library and he finds out the sun is a star. Well, if the sun is a star... And, and all those stars out there are suns. All those suns could have planets around them as well. So he, he, the universe grew right there in his head uh, just from being inspired at that moment. And you see what he did. Uh, the George Cuvier we talked about drawing with his mother, the Mary Ward, who was a little kid drawing things on the, on the ground, laying in the grass, drawing blades of grass and insects. But uh, so many other ones. Ada Lovelace, who wrote the first computer program, well, people don't know, when she was eight years old, she got the measles and was crippled. So she actually walked with uh, crutches. But by the time she was 12, because she had all that downtime of laying in bed, thinking and dreaming, uh, she when she was 12, she wrote a book called Flyology uh, on how to fly. And this is years before the Wright brothers ever thought about it. And she's, you know, she's writing down, I need this for wings. And, and granted, she, she her, her flying machine was like a Trojan horse with wooden wings on it, but she wasn't far. And she was 12, and this was, you know, in in the in the uh, in the 1800s. So she, right. she was that she was she was she was that far ahead as a 12 year old thinking about the future of things. Uh, and you could look at that and just say some kids have it and some kids don't, mm-hmm. but they were inspired. And so you can't just say they had it or they didn't. Maybe maybe they were average and they were inspired. You know, I don't think that you have to. Uh, Exposure, exposing kids to as much as you can when they're young, when they're absorbing things is very important. And uh, I learned from myself, even older, you can you can still absorb things. Uh, let's talk about the gun debate. <laughs> <laughs> so you take a you take a fella who loves his guns, right? Mm-hmm. He can tell you the make and model of all those guns. Right. He can tell you the ins and outs. He can break it down. He can tell you the ballistics involved in it. He can tell you how much powder, what makes it hot, what makes that bullet go. He can tell you about the rifling of the barrel. He can tell you about the rifling of the barrel and how it spins the bullet. He can tell you so much technical stuff about that gun because he loves it. Mm-hmm. And he learned that later on in life because he was inspired to. How many people do you know like that that you don't think are that educated, but know all of those things. Mm-hmm. So imagine if anybody spent a few years learning about a single subject, mm-hmm. uh, they say that you could become the foremost expert in that subject. Well, when you look at that guy who has learned so much about these guns, you realize that that is a truth. Mm-hmm. And so all you have to do is inspire somebody to love something so much that they want to learn. And you don't have to so take a teacher back in, in school a teacher's job would be a whole lot easier if the class was about inspiring because once you inspire somebody they want to learn and they're going to go get that information on their own they're going to go out there and chase it mm-hmm. you know my kid loves frogs i didn't teach her about frogs she just seen a frog one day fell in love with it all she wants to do is learn about frogs mm-hmm. you know when she's 12 years old, she'll probably be able to tell you every breed of a frog. She'll probably be able to tell you what they do, where they live, and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Just because of that inspiring moment doesn't mean she's going to become a, a herpetologist or whatever. You know, well, we've got a program for that here. Huh? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you 
know, studying reptiles and amphibians and stuff like that. But she's well on her way. Uh, and even if she doesn't, she's still going to know a shit ton about frogs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, whatever else is involved with that. So inspiration is everything. Uh, you know, uh, and I wasn't inspired until I wasn't inspired in school. I was taught in school. I was never taught what I could do with the information. Yeah. That, yeah, that is, uh, yeah, it seems like a lot of the way that schools even today teach the information is, is it doesn't connect up. Right. Like, um, like, uh, I feel that even in high school, you know, I, I think I got a, a good you know, education in biology in high school. I think the ideas were presented as all these isolated topics. Right. Like, why does natural selection connect up with speciation? Why does speciation connect up with common descent? Like, you learn about each of these things. Yeah, there, like, yeah, there are different types of selection. There are different types of speciation. And then there's this idea of common descent. But why? Why are all of these interconnected? And and so I I try to, to explain that in my video. Do you, do you think your science teacher understood? Yeah, I, I think she understood. I think it was just the way that the, maybe the material was structured in the book. Okay. That it made it. Uh, Difficult. Yeah, I mean. Because often what I see, and I, I saw it with uh, my daughter's, uh, hopefully she sees this, I saw it with my daughter's third grade teacher, uh, my oldest daughter's third grade teacher. Uh, when it came to science and uh, stuff, uh, she, you know, that one teacher has to teach all these subjects. But when it came to the science part of that class, she was, she had no clue what she was talking about. Uh, so much so that I would have to red ink my daughter's uh, work that she graded, like Lila would come home and she would have like a C or something on a test. Mm -hmm. And then I would look and all the answers would be correct. <laughs> and she had a C, so I would have to go back and correct it enough so that the teacher had to write me a letter saying, I'm sorry for my incompetence. Mm -hmm. And some of it was so simple as, as, uh, you know, what is our, what, what, uh, what is, uh, what is our atmosphere made of? Uh, what's, what's the uh, what's the largest ingredient of our atmosphere? You know, and the answer would be nitrogen. And uh, she had that mark. My daughter had nitrogen. She had that marked off and wrote in oxygen. And come on, you know, you're teaching the science and you don't understand a lick of it. And that's okay. Stick to the book. <laughs> yeah. If you stick to the book, we'll be okay. I won't. I won't bash you. And we'll walk through this together. Uh, uh, but Lila, Lila would come home upset because she was being taught uh, things wrong that she had already known at third grade. Right. What was correct. Yeah, so Savannah, that kind of happened to Savannah. She um, she was taught, or when it came to, you know, time to teach evolution in her middle school, the teacher said, you know, you can read about it in the book. Of course, the teacher didn't make them read it. And then, of course, the students weren't going to read it, weren't going to read, you know, a chapter in some textbook that the teacher right. wasn't going to make them read it and so they weren't exposed to it and so she had to get that information later uh you know in high school right but and that that happens a lot it's, it's really sad that that happens but it does it's sad and you, you it could also make people mad you mm -hmm. know once you once you don't get some information when you're young and or you get false information when you're young and then you get older and you get correct information you'll look back and you'll be like why did you rob me of this much time uh, I, 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 I won't say I love, I love whenever I was in school, but I kind of resented the fact that, that, uh, I wasn't inspired, uh, because I had this love. I would, I, geology was in my, my blood, yet I didn't know it. You know, that's where I would be right now. I yeah. would be digging I, and rock. I took a course in uh, geology last semester. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, they teach. Uh, they've got a whole building for geology. Is that one right over there? Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's like an allosaurus skeleton. Have you ever been in that building? No, I haven't. Oh, there's like an allosaurus skeleton. Maybe if the door's running, I'll take a second. Okay. Uh, we'll <laughs> the, uh, but, the, you know, it's, it's all about inspiring kids when they're little. So I, I wrote the Tiny Thinkers books to, to hopefully do that. And uh, it, the, the objective is to get it in as many hands as possible. And uh, that's what we're working on right now. 
you're only going to see two books published per year. But we need to work hard at getting these into AR programs in schools so that kids are uh, doing their accelerated reading. Right. Uh, and that schools are more uh, inclined to buy the books and have the books if they're, uh, if they're STEM rated or they're in AR. And then, uh, I mean, they're the kind of book that should be in every every school library and every school classroom for mm -hmm. a kid who's between first and third grade. Right. And so that's hopefully where we get with them. And so far, so good. Uh, when Charlie came out, we Charlie came out. It was a self-published and a uh, a book before we got picked up, and it sold sixteen hundred copies in six days. Oh wow! Yeah, that's awesome. And it, that is awesome. So the desire was out there for people to get it, and that was with no marketing. So, uh, so we, we see a bright future for the books, but we had to slow down because none of us knew anything about the book business. But now we got picked up by a larger publisher, and, and uh, they make the rules, so they know what they're doing. So you'll see two books a year, and uh, hopefully we can inspire some kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a few of the, of the, the future books. Okay. Or, uh, how many of those do you want to tell us? Uh, the books that I think is the coolest and, and that's going to have the most value is, uh, so I have a book about uh, Alfred Wegener, who basically is, that's an important component for kids to understand is, you know, Pangea and all those things and, and how he looked at them the same way. Every kid sits in class looking at a world map saying, South America and Africa fit together. Every, I th everybody, if they don't, then, you know, I, I don't know, but I've met so many people that look at it, and, and that's all basically Alfred Beckner did was he was like, hey, they fit together. Let me look and see what's in the ground on each side and, and to, to make sure that they once fit together. And the strata that's over here matches the strata that's over here. Animals that were over here match animals that were over here and the only way that that could have happened because these animals don't swim is if these two places once touched and but you also have to have a, a the concept of a you know time right. uh, long long periods of time and and but he was able to match you know stuff in northern europe to stuff that was in maine mm -hmm. uh you know so we know that those things have touched before and so that's a really cool book, and I think it'd be a cool book for kids to get a greater understanding of the world and the age of the earth that way. Uh, then I have just books that I think are fun. Uh, William Herschel discovered Uranus, and he named it George. <clears throat> and, you know, that didn't last long, but we used to have a planet named George for a minute. Uh, let me think... Uh, other cool ones, you know. I, I have Teslas, and I got I got the ones that are more popular for people. But probably the the two that I'm most proud of uh, that I really want to see is Rachel, which will be the next one. I love the Rachel book, and then I have a book about uh, Garrett Morgan, who was an African American inventor who invented basically what would later become the gas mask, and he was a true hero. And and it's uh unfortunate that a lot of african-american kids they have so many heroes of the past that they don't even know about and there's a ridiculous amount of inventors and scientists that uh were written out of history basically right. you know a lot of times when we hear about women in science they weren't just written out of history their ideas were stolen oh yeah it's, they were still in history but their ideas were stolen well with some of these scientists like garrett morgan and such the uh, uh, Garrett, not so much, but the only one that we learned about in school was George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. Why was George Washington Carver okay? But none of these other guys were important enough to teach about. Now, George Washington Carver, he was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. you know. And But here's the messed up thing about George Washington Carver. We learned us about the peanuts. Yeah. Well, George Washington Carver was so much more than peanuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was... He was doing kind of what Percy Julian was doing, working with the oils of these plants. But he worked with Henry Ford on making plastics for cars. Uh, he built mobile labs to teach farmers how to farm and uh, to bring education to rural areas. And so George Washington Carver was also a painter. You know, there's so many awesome things about this guy. And we just learned about the peanuts. Right. We learned about crop rotation. And uh, it's kept simple. But there's so many African-American scientists that are like truly heroes that 
physically saved people that changed the world forever. And I will guarantee you if you walk out in any neighborhood around here and you ask any of these kids about who these people are, they have no idea. Yet, something in their everyday lives it was made by these guys or yeah. a part of it. Uh, we need to give people heroes. Uh, like my daughters, they, they don't really care if it's a female scientist or a male scientist when, they, when they're reading the books, but there, there's a lot of girls that it would matter to if they would see that there's more female heroes in this regard or that regard. Uh, and we have a we have so many books about women in science with uh, Rachel Carson and Ada and Mary Anning and uh, Mary Ward and Marie, 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 Marie Curry. Mitchell, yeah. Marie Curry. Well, my book about Marie Curry is uh, Marie and Pierre What a Pair, so I got both of them in there. Yeah. So, but I got, I got so many books. You name a scientist, I pretty much have it covered. Uh, for the most part, if 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 a, if a scientist is a household name, I have it covered. Uh, and then I got so many that are not household names that, uh, uh like with, uh, I recently did a Arn Ra show and, you know, he was stumped on two of them that I gave him. He got the Carl Sagan one, but, you know, these are pretty important scientists and, and even somebody as brilliant as that guy, uh, you know, don't even know about them, but would be fascinated to learn about them once, once they discover who they were. So. Uh, well. Uh, you want to call uh, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, we're going to let this helicopter fly over for us. The, uh, I guess the only thing that I want people to know is, is uh, uh, bear with us. The books will come out slowly, they, you know, two books a year. Uh, but they are available. You can find them on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Uh, I get letters uh, from kids all over the world now. I get letters from kids in Australia and Germany and, and uh, uh, Singapore here recently. Uh, so the books are out there. They're available to anybody who sees this podcast. You can walk into a bookstore if they don't have it on the shelf. They'll order it and have it in a day. So, oh, great. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for coming on today. All right. Thank you. All right. I thank enjoyed you. it immensely.